Hey, hello, I'm Ren Ribeiro, and I want to connect with you about peace and justice. We are interviewing women who labor for peace, as we have forever and always will, until we all feel peace in our homes, our workplaces, our communities, and especially our bodies and minds. This initiative is named Mujeres Co-Labor for Peace. It's a show of intimate conversations with justice workers who are healing their self and communities from the effects of misogyny, capitalism, and climate change. Welcome to the show. My name is Ren Ribeiro, and I wish you complete wellness and lasting peace. In this episode of Mujeres Co-Labor for Peace, we're exploring capitalism from the vibrant perspective of cooperation as a formal business structure with deep values baked into the bylaws. It is a wonderful topic, and we've got two leaders joining us for episode eight, which is a continuation of the intimate conversation about democracy and social justice. Our guests, Emily Kawano from the Wellspring Cooperative and the Massachusetts Solidarity Economy Network, and Sarah Acefa from the Coalition of Worker Ownership and Power and the Dorchester Food Cooperative, gave us so much rich content in Episode 7 that we're continuing into Episode 8. But before we jump back in, let's take a moment to check in with our hearts and take a deep breath of awareness. In this moment, my heart is feeling a little quiet, slow and steady, and perfectly fine. <laughs> How is your heart? Hmm. Wonderful. Now let's get back to the conversation about the possibilities and tensions in the alliance building efforts with worker-owned cooperatives and labor unions. Yeah, I think you're right that there is um, there's momentum there. Uh, that being said, I I mean maybe there will be like an exponential um, turning um, towards each other, um, but it's it's been there for quite a long time. If you remember the steel workers announced a long time ago, 10 years at least ago, right, this partnership with Mondragon mm -hmm. to develop um, to develop co-ops, worker-owned co-ops. A lot of them were, were to be conversions. And that's just been a really slow process. I believe, as far as I know, there were a couple um, attempts and startups that didn't pan out in the end. The one that's still standing that I know of is works in Worcester. So mm -hmm. yay, hooray for them. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I also think it's really important to do some assessment. Like why, why after 10 plus years, why has there been so little fruition? Um, yeah, I think it would be really interesting to know. And there are other unions as well that have been working on co-ops. And it's a, it's a slow, long, slow process, and there are lots of other battles to be fought. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really, really encouraging and really exciting. At the same time, it's a slow process from what I've seen. And I think for us to kind of understand what are the challenges would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's take a deep breath and like hold the potential of these partnerships and the pace to kind of meet the the the, the urgencies. Let's meet each other in in really good ways so that the the steps unfold the the way that is in right relationship to each other and the work and the planet and all of these things it's um i feel it as a as a spiritual kind of thing when when the resonance is right it's not work it's labor and the labor of resonance of of inspiration and growth collectively um, i'm kind of like working on a new definition of labor for myself um as opposed to work that's drudgery and it's 
it's like this this grind the grind culture that that we're part of um and and the labor feels like it it, it just has this generativeness um so let's take a take a breath and and hold that um that vision together oh so um, I wonder if each of you have any questions for each other um, that that may be bubbling up at the moment before we get into the next prompt. Hmm. I'm really glad you brought up the land trusts, Emily, because I was I've been curious about it. I've been kind of like watching from afar and um, have a, a sense of the um potential liberation through through the land trusts model there's no way of like holding land that's not in ownership and in, in a capitalist way at the very moment but it's cl as close as we i think we can get um at the moment uh, as a vehicle for bringing people together in, in right relationship to the land so i'm really glad that you brought that up um and and Sarah, I'm super glad that you brought up the the Dorchester Food Co-op and the the food sovereignty and the sovereignty of of workers. Um, those two things to me feel so alive, and and I want to insert myself in ways, but I'm a, one human being, and I don't know how to split myself in in time to 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 like do the things that that I want to labor on. Aside from this particular show at the moment. Um, if I were to do anything, it would be getting my hands in the soil and working with people. Um, that's not my skill set at the moment, but uh, you know that that feels like the the most beautiful thing that that we can do, given the state of soil and the state of food and and access and so forth. It's really really important. I remember um, last year a conversation with some of the folks from Rising to Own It, aspiring worker owners and worker owners from across Massachusetts. And people were talking about psychological safety a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And what is psychological safety? Like to be an entrepreneur, you've got to have all kinds of things like access to housing <laughs> and health. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, these, we want to see a cooperative economy, but it needs to be holistic. And um, yeah, like, um, yeah, one of the, uh, a neighbor of mine just moved to the next town over because Boston's too expensive and he's an amazing worker owner from Boston. <laughs> it's like, ah, your commute is longer now because we haven't figured out the whole housing bit. So anyways, like how can we all feel like, yeah, this is my town <laughs> without it having to be only your town. How could be our town? Yeah. So I say, you know, I love this song. This land is your land. This land is my land. And I sort of, we started singing, this town is your town. This town is my town. Oh, and then, uh, and then I remember, just saying, uh, this land is my land, and your land is my land, and I think he was talking about our settler colonialism. Anyways, so many land issues. We all have to learn a lot more about. Um, I'm really excited that Topa has a chance, a tenant opportunity to purchase. I, I know it like got through both sides of the legislature the house and the House and Senate. So uh, in the past, and then it stopped with the governor before okay. but now we have a progressive governor so we have yeah. a chance i just oh, was scrolling through the interwebs and the social medias this morning and i saw something about a trailer park in newton that has been taken over by a corporation that's jacking up the rent every year mm. and it's like ah. but in washington state they managed to like get topa a tenant opportunity to purchase four trailer parks and it has just sort of allowed people to collectively cooperatively preserve a whole ownership class in society which is so important like that house is like the foundation for all of all of our dreams and yeah this is our town how do we make this town work for all of us um, yeah and this is our planet town. right and if we're all like saying oh i i really i it, the decisions i make matter to the whole planet and we it's all of our planet right so all of those things are they they matter and if we can all collectively agitate co-agitate then it doesn't feel like such a personal burden it's a you know many hands kind of thing yeah thanks yeah i guess i'll i'll jump in with just some of the tensions right around um creating more 
uh, thriving community. So again, I'm going to use the example of uh, where the where my ceramic studio is. You know, there's this whole vision of um, kind of building on a little bit, replicating what's going on in East Hampton. So East Hampton was also a very, uh, very much a, a deindustrialized, very, very struggling um, uh, city. And it's been revitalized through the arts, right? There's these great big mill buildings and there's all kinds of interesting things in there. Um, and and it's, it's an interesting town now. There's interesting stuff and beautiful restaurants and all this, but there has been gentrification. Absolutely. And so when, when in, in the town of Ware, when we were talking about this at our studio and people were all excited about, yeah, there's a possibility of really bringing, um, using arts or bringing arts to the fore in this little town and, and um, connecting with East Hampton, the town, the town manager and planner and learning those lessons. Um, the question is, can you do it without displacing? And do people actually want to do it without displacing, right? Um, there are some people uh, that would argue, oh, we want we want that displacement, right? Like, so there are really people, there are people that are really, really low income. And there are some people that are like, yeah, let's kind of shove them out of town. That's how we're going to get like market rate housing. And that's how we're going to get a nice shiny little town. Those are hard conversations. Those are hard conversations. Um, and when you're talking to, to uh, maybe folks who um, are looking for a little bit of a, of a, a step up, um, it's hard to sometimes to make these arguments, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so those are some of the tensions. Um, yeah. I appreciate you bringing so, that up. Lots of contradictions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're realities, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're real truths, hard truths and hard conversations, mm -hmm. um, can't be had without some skill and some structure and some, um, some heart, you know, like, and I'm wondering, um, for me, when I think about my experiences, in capitalism for you know, typical corporations versus worker owned spaces, um, the values, the, the way the values are written into uh, accountability measures and how each other, we're holding each other accountable to the explicit values that we're all trying to uphold. That is the kind of skill building that could undergird some of these harder conversations. Um, and, and, a, at a pace that is in right relationship to all all diverging positions or or people at the table or all stakeholders that that are part of the conversation just thinking about um how some of these um housing uh, the condos in East Hampton that you were referencing they start at $650,000 for a tiny space some of them don't even have windows like that to me is the epitome of gentrification yeah. and i know the the mill the the um industrial town that you're talking about um and i i'm like how do we stop that from happening how do we have these conversations on or do we have the level? you know do we have that right like so there were, there would be some people that are probably really struggling that might benefit, right? So housing prices go up. If they're a homeowner, the renters are not going to benefit. But if they're a homeowner, they may well, right? Even if it means they get displaced, they get to sell their house, right? They build up right. some 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 assets and wealth. Like so who's who's to say, right? There are people that have been left out of prosperity and this is their shop. Possibly. Who are we to say, right? Like, no, you know, like, yeah. no, we're, we're invested in permanently affordable housing. And that's a hard conversation when you're, when you're working in these struggling communities. So this is a general observation, right? Whether it's Springfield or Holyoke or, or where. Or Chester. Yeah, exactly. You know, okay. yeah. it's hard to say, Oh, we want to bring in these values of greater equity and opportunity for everybody. But that means, oh, you don't get to flip your house now that there's gentrification for, and finally get your little nest egg, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, um, it's interesting, right? 
Go ahead, please, yeah. Sarah. I'm yeah. thinking about that a lot in Dorchester and uh, Roxbury as well. And yeah, I mean, it's a symptom of the system that we set up, which is capitalism. Like, you know, like some of the progressive projects that we have happening, the biggest, uh, you know, breaks are elder homeowners. And it's mm-hmm. because their house is their primary wealth that's going to take care of them when they're old, because that's our system here. Right. Um, in other communities, it might be the solidarity economy of family care, which has its ups and downs too. But, you know, like, we got to socialize it over here um, and make it awesome. <laughs> and um, uh, so that people don't feel like they have to squeeze their neighbors to have a future. Right. Um, and uh, so we think about this a lot with the Dorchester Food Co-op a lot. We want this to, to, to be a community asset to build wealth and not to create divestment for the people who need it most. Like if we want to be about food justice, food security, food sovereignty, uh, mm-hmm. gentrification is not that, you know, like, I mean, kicking people out, making their own communities more unaffordable is not what it's about. So, you know, grappling with this in a really serious way, there are some, some people who've been thinking long and hard about this. Um, like Darnell Adams, one of the mm-hmm. earlier co-op organizers of the place, um, who has an amazing uh, uh, CDI live about gentrification of food co-ops. And um, can you say that? I was Sarah? also uh, talking CDI live. What what is that? Oh, the Cooperative Development Institute. Is that what you're referring to? I think so, but maybe I have it wrong. Maybe it's CFI. <laughs> oh, okay. Food Co-op Initiative FCI, FCI. live. Beautiful. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so check it out. <laughs> um, uh, but sometimes, um, like food co-ops, in some cases, are characterized as the thin edge of gentrification. Right? It's a signal to like cool progressive people that this is an up and coming neighborhood, right? And so it can be um, part of that, unless I mean, unless you're careful, right? And you start working on some of the other structural things, like um, like preventing gentrification and skyrocketing housing and rental prices. If you're not doing that, then a food co-op, yeah, it's great. But yeah, if you look at the larger impact that it's possibly contributing towards. Anyway, complicated. Yeah, right. right. It's very complicated. And we talk about this a lot. Uh, the one solution I've heard from Boone is that it would not cause gentrification if the food co-op was on a community land trust. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> well, if there is a, I mean, it doesn't mean that the food co-op needs to be part of, but there, if there is a community land trust that's that's protecting um, this, the affordable housing, yeah, that would be a solution for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. But how often does that happen, right? Like those aren't partnered up things, right? I mean, just in general, solidarity economy can be accused of that, right? That various kinds of solidarity economy initiatives, food co-ops or groovy, I don't know, community gardening or any number of of nice projects that we would embrace could be sort of that thin edge of gentrification. And without joining it up and thinking about how to, um, to protect affordable housing, yeah, um, and then it's also like trying to introduce that in in towns that are completely unfamiliar with any of these concepts whatsoever. Oh my gosh, right. There's so it's, much education to do. It's, it's hard. It's, it's hard and it's yeah. awkward, um, but important. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, <laughs> I I have a question for both of you on the tip of my tongue and it's it's like I'm so into the words that we're sharing here that it's it's um kind of flowing around um I'll I guess I'll come back to it in a minute um well I guess I'll share with you the image that I'm having because I can see that a lot more clearly clearly in my mind about how um the the pieces can come together but not meet like or, or, or the pieces can be like so ready like we've got these uh like um uh, you know we've got um um cases del campo we've got some wonderful food growers in in western massachusetts anyway i'm not sure about dorchester or the the boston area as much I'm not as familiar we've got all these wonderful things and then we've got all these community gardens and we've got like things that are happening but how do we weave them together so my question is for both views like 
to what extent as a coalition of worker ownership and power or as an incubator of of cooperatives, do either of you feel like uh, able and um, to to bring in more mainstream people to hold that, maybe not mainstream people, but um, more resources, more more people, m build a bigger movement around reinforcing and making, weaving those those connections um, while you're doing all the other five points of the mission or, or you know, like wrangling in-person events to 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 make sure that we're representative of the voice of of the worker ownership um movement in in massachusetts anyway um so that's that's a question of like resource building it's it's the the just transition right where are the edges of that in in both of our both of your spaces yeah Great question. I can I can start. Um, when I think about the this kind of multifaceted CLTs, leveraging CLTs to build local solidarity economy ecosystems, I think that we're, we've recognized that there are kind of two legs to stand on. One, there are opportunities, properties that are coming um, that are available, um, part, various kinds of partnership, and that lends a certain urgency to move on those opportunities. Um, and the other is is recognizing that building that community engagement and take up um, and buy in is really, really, really important. So I feel like in Holyoke Springfield, we're trying to walk on both on both legs, right? We there's a number of uh, concrete possibilities um, that we're we're working on and exploring um, at the same time. Um, doing those those community meetings, trying to do a lot of um, both consultation and harvest people's input, but also because people are not already familiar with a lot of these models also do some education around them right like to me one of the um one of the challenging um, maxims that we we throw around on the left a, a lot is it all has to be community led mm -hmm. and, and then on top of that it's all going to be led by x y or z particular identity right mm -hmm. um I think part of leadership is also providing um, things that people don't know. People don't know many things. They don't know um, what is a co-op. They don't know what is a CLT. They don't, X, Y, and Z, right? They're like what you eat and breathe in this society is a capitalist vision. Therefore, it's not surprising. They don't know alternatives, right? So I think it is, yes, you need that um, community leadership, but you also need to bring in new information and the possibility. And then it's up to the community as to what they want to want to engage in. But um, so that also is a um, trying to do that in an authentic and and a real way is is also it's a long process. Yeah. Yeah. And thanks for doing it. Yeah. Era, your thoughts. Yeah, there's a lot we don't know. There's also a lot we do know. We forget that we know. Like, there's so much in our cultures of cooperation that just comes so naturally to us. And uh, yeah, we're sort of in this capitalist Kool Aid that says that you know competition is the way. But you know, it's also you know our ability to cooperate that makes us with small teeth and <laughs> wobbly legs able to be. <laughs> I love the question you're asking. Uh, earlier, we were talking about um, democratic control over the fragile systems that upon which our lives depend. And um, yeah, so this sort of brings us to value chains, you know, supply chains. Um, uh, the value chain approach, I think, is really interesting. Um, when you look at everything, you know, all the goods and services that we need from production to consumption, um, as far as possible, if we can make those chains short so that we are making as much as we can, like um, Emily was talking about these community uh, production centers that uh, mm -hmm. that you're talking Evans. about, Blair Evans uh, Center for Community Production. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So making that as short and local and sustainable as possible, and as community controlled as possible instead of corporate um, controlled, is is powerful and important. Um, and also just looking at all the value chains for everything we depend on, whether it's internet services or um, food. You know, like who are the actors that are who are touching? 
and exchanging these goods and services uh, as they make their way to us. Um, and, um, you know, where, where at each of those nodes is there an opportunity for more democratic con community control? More, not only, <laughs> but more. Mm -hmm. um, and so studying that is super interesting and there's a lot of scope for making a difference there. Um, you know, you're talking about tightening up the connections between various types of food production and um, in, in the state. And, and food consumption um, and, and, and in a broader geography too, bioregionally. And um, yeah, so, so, you know, looking at those actors, often business players um, and, and seeing where we have common interest, where we can tighten up the slack, where we can share information um, to, to, to make sure that uh, these patterns, these flows of resources and services suit us as much as possible and we can make sure that we're voting our conscience with our dollars, our conscience. Um, and then there's this extended value chain within which these flows exist. So this is like social norms and policy and all of that's important. So the value chain approach I think is super helpful for helping to connect those dots. Uh, even if it's not actually that now we know each other, um, somebody in East Hampton is going to feed me in Dorchester something, but like we can connect with ideas. Um, we can connect, you know, it might be materially. Um, we can put our power together in business, et cetera. So I'm excited about um, local supply chains, cooperative supply chains. Would love to join hands with everybody who wants to look at connecting those dots a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. And just people join join coalitions, know that you you can plug in because there's a need and there's there's structures to hold people's enthusiasm for making a difference. You know, Wellspring, absolutely. There's ways to plug into community groups that um, that you, you can say, hey, I've got things for you to do. If you've got time and energy and will and and inspiration to come help um there's there's more than enough uh, for you to do and co the um, coalition of worker ownership and power for sure like what's your thought like come in and ask questions and and meet people and and uh and and grow the the cooperative space there's so many ways to to help out there um i'm i'm noticing we're at time and um i want to take a deep breath with you of appreciation and i also want to say that um there are constant victories to celebrate. Sarah, I know you do an amazing job of that. And um, um, Emily, you hold spaces for celebration that have been very gratifying for, for me to participate in, in and um, I'm sure for for everyone. Um, but even if they, if the justice victories can seem far off and few and far between, uh, particularly legislatively sometimes, um, it's it's uh, the the pace of cooperative uh, movements is is I feel unstoppable. There's there's just too much rightness in it and too many wrongs to heal <laughs> to to not continually grow the the cooperative spaces, the worker ownership, all the the justice work that that um, that, that the left <laughs> at least that we align with uh, our our um, intent on doing. So um, I'll, I'll close by saying that community that begins with deep respect and curiosity for that which emerges through one another, community that understands its interdependence on other healthy ecosystems is what the cooperative sector is all about. Um, I put this other piece here um, that I, that I want to read and, and it feels really important uh, in, in the light of cancel culture and some, some wonderful humans that have um, have been suffering and the, the revolution that's building around that. Do we have the courage to want all women to experience power? What do we believe about powerful women? We've got a couple here who are amazing, and I'm so glad you've joined Mujeres Co-Labor for Peace today. And I wish you so much goodness in your movement building. Uh, so join me for more of the conversation about healing from the effects of capitalism next time in part three on Mujeres Co-Labor for Peace. I am Ren Ribeiro, and I thank you for joining. Thank you. Nice to be here. You as well. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. 
This initiative is supported by Inner Fortune, the full life self coaching journal that is now digital. Join us for peace and thank you for your heart.